Hi, I hope this is working and we're live. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. I'm Pallavi Ayer. I'm a journalist and author based in um, Tokyo in Japan currently. And I have a fabulous panel here with me today. Uh, and we're going to be discussing the idea of supporting cross-boundary entrepreneurship. Um, hi, I think Chandani has also just joined us. <laughs> Welcome. So, you know, um, often innovators develop in-house as uh, micro ventures and often they locate within local clusters using a local language of understanding, um, a local understanding of the needs of financing, of staff development and so on. Um, are these transferable to a new society? How can we ensure that innovations and entrepreneurs move location in a new normal situation in a post-COVID world without hindrance. Um, joining um, this panel today um, is a fantastic cast of characters. Uh, we have uh, Shumoke Acharya, who is the CEO of eTrans Solution, um, which is in the business of providing vehicle tracking solutions, digital information networks in the logistics space to heavyweight um, corporate shippers and transporters. Um, we have uh, Pham uh, Thi Mile, who's the chairwoman of Le, Li and Associates in Vietnam. She's a serial entrepreneur focused really on human resources services and on tech, both onshore and offshore outsourcing. Her current role is at LNA Investment Corporation, and it's managing particularly the relationship between Vietnamese and Japanese um, shareholders. We have Santosh um, Yella Jusula, uh, who is a board member of Singular Chain. He's really our blockchain guy on this panel, a decentralization activist. Um, he currently focuses on tokenization of equity for private markets and enterprise grade blockchain adoption. Uh, we have Bernhard Steinruck, who's the Director General of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce in India. And last but certainly not least, we have Chandni Jain, uh, who is the CEO of Aquan. Um, and she will, uh, Aquan really works with investment managers in the UK to build data science and machine learning solutions. It's interesting because while the majority of the team is based in India, they also have a significant presence um, in the UK. Um, uh, and they really moved to the UK to sell to customers there, raise capital there and so on. So a great example um, of the cross-border entrepreneurship that we will be um, talking more about today. So, you know, technology has really um, enabled businesses these days to get more globally connected than ever before, allowing organizations to join forces across professions, across geographies and across industries. And these collaborations are, of course, a great way to enhance innovation and to cross pollinate ideas and experiences. But in, um, in spite or despite the existence of all of these technologies, there are still several hurdles to be overcome when you're looking at cross-border entrepreneurship. Um, there's obviously the problems of culture with varied communication styles, differing value sets and professional standards. And now, um, given um, the post-COVID um, world, there are obviously physical challenges too. We have this brave new world um, so the whole discussion um, of cross-border entrepreneurship and its challenges and its possibilities um, has really taken a different spin, a different tack today than, say, three or four months ago. Um, so I'm going to um, start by asking each of you to kind of make an opening statement, keeping in mind the topic that we're discussing, and then we can broaden it out into a deeper conversation. Um, I will ask each of you to respond with thoughts and comments to each other as well. So please don't just talk, but listen to the others um, as well. Um, let's um, kick off with uh, Mile, if that's all right. She's the, she's the first person on the right of my screen so uh, take it away um, hello everyone uh, my name is Le uh, from Vietnam and um, my viewpoint in the challenges and principles for cross-border entrepreneurship during this COVID season is that uh, we have to uh, uh, top up on whatever uh, it has been some new traits 
I mean, the challenge is um, will be the in-person presence. Certainly, in this season, it's very difficult to engage uh, people across border in person. Traveling is a problem; is constraint now. Um, and I mean, market insight, understanding of the market, the clients, the buyers, and suppliers, and also the staff uh, thinking and the culture is there as ever. Um, And then I think with so many changes in a short while and unprecedented uh, uh, practice, we may feel that it's very difficult to, to be ready. Uh, it's tough for business uh, to be ready and adapt to the new situation. So the principles on my viewpoint is to reinvent um, the business uh, or, or myself in, my own business. Uh, we try to do something new on top of what available, uh, but um, because of the constraints in the physical contact, we try to tune in more virtuality. Uh, certainly, our business is more on the human resources, outsourcing and services, so it's quite uh, labor intensive. And uh, luckily, Recently, during the last few years, we already invested a lot into uh, HR technology. So we leverage those things to deliver. And at the moment, we, we can uh, have quite a good base to um, invent something uh, on top of the normal operation. Uh, but uh, stay agile is also a principle that uh, we have to... Uh, Uh, think of uh, because the adaptability must be faster uh, and who knows what will happen tomorrow. The stock, stock future is there. Uh, even in Vietnam at the moment, everything is nearly back to the old normal, but we are not sure whether somebody will get sick tomorrow in the community and things will be stopped again. Um, And I think our mentality, the principle to do things with collaboration and partnership is also uh, something to think about. Uh, because now, if we can't do everything by our own hands, um, we can. We, we need to, to engage more people and open up uh, with more collaboration with different partners around the world. Those are my point, key points. Thanks a lot uh, for that opening statement and uh, lots of food for thought there. And we'll delve into some of the things um, that you talked about uh, further along um, this discussion. But can I turn to Santosh now um, to give us an opening um, statement and some thoughts? Yeah. Well, thank you for having us here, first of all. Um, so in my perspective, um, I think future of cross-border entrepreneurship is dependent on three pillars. Uh, future of finance to start with. Um, how can you uh, onboard customers and users from anywhere in the world? The ability to uh, accept payments and pay back to all these guys from around the world. The ability to um, hire people from anywhere in the world, um, you know, which is su super important in my perspective, um, to share ownership to these people uh, who join your organization. Um, the second pillar being future of organizations itself, um, how organizations are run, um, has significantly changed, right? Uh, from pre-internet times, you have these organizations which are mostly local, um, relied on a lot of intermediaries to actually, you know, look at them like a bridge to the outside world. And then you have internet, which actually got you sort of digital customers, you know, or users, especially this is true for technology and technology-based businesses. Um, so in my perspective, it still, it still should evolve a bit more, right? So uh, we are able to onboard customers. Uh, we are able to get, receive all this value as organizations, yet uh, the store of this value is still legacy. Um, it's still analog, right? Um, I mean, in a sense, if uh, we're looking at a private company uh, in India, especially, like uh, the store of value equity is in paper stock, right? And paper stock and legacy systems. So to me, um, that has to evolve a bit more, um, you know, and the third 
pillar is how regulators, governments, um, all these organizations uh, which support entrepreneurship can run um, on par with how technology is running and how technology businesses would want them to run. Um, in a sense, there's always a growing narrative that these regulators um, are always lagging behind. Um, so it boils down to that as well, right? So it, it's important to have stuff like cross-country compliance, um, your regulators being able to support um, businesses to be able to, to raise capital from around the world. Um, especially in the recent wake of times, I've seen uh, venture capital community, uh, especially complaining, saying uh, it's harder to invest in an Indian uh, company and it's even harder to exit from an Indian company. So. Uh, it's really important that we build uh, these three pillars and support entrepreneurship to become borderless. Um, that's my perspective. Thanks a lot for that. Um, as I said earlier, we'll delve into some of these issues in um, greater detail. Um, it's interesting because, you know, so much of what you say um, depends upon uh, globalization, basically. And, you know, we're getting a situation now where we're seeing a worrying return of nationalism and tribalisms and things closing down rather than opening up, which was uh, sort of a trend for many years in this world. So let, let's discuss some of that uh, in more detail going forward in this panel. But first, may I ask uh, Shomo to um, give us an opening statement? Hi. Uh, first, let me give a little introduction to me, my company. We are in the uh, space of digital uh, communication in the cargo and logistics area. We are in telematics and we are a little better than any other companies because we probably have moved into an area where things are moving, uh, looking a little better than before. Well, now, if we get to where we are, we know pre-COVID very well. We are now in COVID, and there is something which is post-COVID. When will it come? We don't know. This is a very uncertain time. Whole lot of problems with life and livelihood going on in our part of the world. But one thing what is very clear that uh, internet and social networking is playing a very critical role in today's world. And I see entrepreneurship, relationship between entrepreneurs, especially uh, localized, I'm not saying localized meaning India, India and the countries alongside India, kind of a, uh, I look at more as an European Union in Asia where there is a need, a hell of a lot of need to cross boundary entrepreneurship. Our focus so far has been in the West. We, we, we import ideas from West and those are the guys, those are the guys who become entrepreneurs. The need has come today to my mind that Southeast Asia and Far East, Far East, if we can create an entrepreneurship a platform in this part of the world, and really start synergizing our powers, this probably can be a disruptor for the world for tomorrow and take us forward in a direction where we want to be. Because very frankly, we are all very, very, we are not too sure. We are pretty nervous in this stage. We don't know where India is going. No doubt Far East probably has now come into a much more steady state than anywhere else. So this is a time I have a feeling on entrepreneurship, there has to be a good relationship between Far East and India. And we go forward, I will give my suggestion for the panel and the uh, participants to consider. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Shomo. Um, I absolutely agree um, with the case that you're making for deepening ties um, with the East. But of course, there are their own set of challenges. Uh, and I look forward to discussing those uh, more with you. Um, and on now to Bernard. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, your initial thoughts, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm representing Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. We are a worldwide or private organization. 
that basically helps German companies and international companies to do global business. And we've been there all in all more than 125 years. We have 140 offices in 92 countries and we reach out to 95% of German foreign trade. And the fact that Germany has been the world champion in exports for many, many years is also a little bit due to this unique network. Now, why am I saying that with regard to cross-border entrepreneurship? When you see why is Germany so successful, it has a lot to do with that. Because over this 125 years, we've developed relationships with all over the world. And normally, the way it goes is investment follows trade. That means first we do trade. And then when we see that a market is interesting and big enough, to invest, then we invest. All this can only be done with cross-border entrepreneurship. Because when you go to a foreign country, you need partners there. You need trust. You need relations. And this is only done with cross-border development. And how has that developed over the centuries? Well, we came with traders. We came with representatives in the various countries. And then we came with our own investment. Now with Corona, one could think this all comes to a standstill because people cannot fly anymore. They cannot get together anymore. We cannot meet at trade fairs anymore and, and. That's true to a certain extent. On the other hand, we have, of course, developed established relationships. And on the basis of these relationships, one still can do a lot and will do it. When it comes to new entrepreneurships and new relationships, then certainly the digital world will be predominant. There is absolutely no way around it. And there is some sort of hope in that because when we look at the developments of the recent years, then it's been pretty phenomenal. And I'm always saying we are so lucky and should be grateful that this Corona crisis came only now and not 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier. We would have been nowhere in the position to be where we are today. So from that angle, with this kind of infrastructure that has been developed, I think we can build well on that. The other thing why I think we can build well are all the startups. The startup scene developed over the last maybe five years uh, was a pretty much digital development. And a lot of the contacts were taken digital. Of course, people were meeting also, but it was not like in the traditional old manner. And here, actually, I think India has a lot of potential because being IT savvy as it is, when we see how India has developed the IT world after Y2K and how the Indians have established themselves in the Silicon Valley, then this is to many respects, also an entrepreneurship that has come digital. But, and with that, I want to finalize my starting statement. One of the biggest worries I have actually with the corona is the fact that the way, especially Indians and also many of the Chinese and other nationalities have been studying abroad, this gets a challenge. And when we see how many million Indians have gone abroad, especially to United States, to Canada and other countries for studying how they have established relationships there, how many of them stayed there for life in an age where they're young and formidable. If this is not going to be able, we will miss a lot. And I can also tell you from my point of view, the fact that the world have, has been relatively peaceful over the last 30 years is due to the fact that youngsters from all over the world met as young people becoming global friends and then as friends you don't have wars. Now, if this is going to be lost and all is going to go digital, we'll miss a lot. And this is actually my biggest worry, that due to the internet, due to not being able to meet, the friendships are going. And that will also be a challenge for entrepreneurship. Maybe that as a start. 
some excellent points there, Bernard. I particularly agree with the point you made about education and how we can have digital modules and we're seeing that, but that does not replace the personal element. Education is not just about receiving the course materials, but about so much more and the sort of complex web of relationships and cultural understandings and cross-border knowledge that you gain by the very fact of physical travel. Um, so yeah. And friendship, and friendship, friendship, the human, I mean, so many people get married from this and that country. You know? I'm not married and like that. I'm married to a Spaniard and we met at university in London. So I'm a living yeah. embodiment of what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, no, absolutely. And I also think it was interesting, the point you made about the fact that um, COVID happened now at this point in society's digital transformation, a transformation that has already been ongoing for many years. And so I think it really has caught us in a more fortunate moment than, say, 10 years ago. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think we can discuss that a little bit further as well. But first, let's bring Chandni into the discussion. Chandni, uh, uh, can we have your initial thoughts, please? Uh, yes, of course. Um, hi. And, uh, well, I don't, uh, I think a lot of my thoughts uh, echo some of the things that have already been said by my fellow, fellow uh, panelists. So without making this too long, uh, just based on uh, our experience, uh, like you mentioned, Pallavi, and we seem to have lost her. Um, uh, just like Pallavi mentioned, uh, we started as an Indian company, started out in India, uh, set up a team in India, then moved to the UK because we saw primary demand for the services we were providing in a big sort of uh, in a country which had a big financial uh, financial uh, center, a lot of activities around a uh, lot of financial activity happening. Uh, that caused us to move to the UK, and but then we quickly realized the competitive advantage we had by basing our tech in India, the, uh, that we could be competitive on price and quality, much, much more competitive than setting up tech in, in the UK. And that, I think, is a big advantage that India has. Uh, the, challenge is, uh, the challenge around it is setting up that structure. We had to struggle quite a bit setting up a structure which allowed us to build in India and sell in the UK uh, and raise capital which is one of the things that Santosh raised, I think, uh, being mm. able to have access to global capital, uh, making it easy setting up as being set up as an Indian entity to be able to raise funds from outside of India, to be able to raise funds where you actually want to be doing business. Uh, we had to take a path of setting up entities in both and then uh, follow complicated legal structure. And that sort of delayed us by a while. That is something that I think if if we truly want to promote cross uh, cross-border entrepreneurship that is something that needs to be simplified uh, in, a, in a global way uh, the second one is access to talent uh, the benefit of this whole digital transformation means you can now you can pretty much hire people anywhere in the world and have them uh, have a global team and uh, have a team that works even across time zones across cultures across uh, different working styles because people are more uh, respectful people are more aware of uh, people globally that comes to the point that Bernard made because young people meet and become friends, they tend to be more aware of other people's cultural uh, demeanor. Uh, and it, for us, it has been quite easy. We, we have a team in London. We have a team in India. We are planning. We are sort of going fully remote in the sense we're open to hiring people any anywhere at this point and being able to onboard them quite easily. Uh, the reason that worked was one because obviously people are more respectful of each other, but also because we were able to facilitate a in-person physical meeting once a year take everybody together and sort of get them to familiarize with each other. And that those are the kinds of things that we think will become challenging with COVID. How do you, while you're meeting people digitally, how do you form those interpersonal relationships that allow you to work better as a team? Uh, I think those are my over and above everything that was said by my fellow panelists. Uh, access to being able to uh, streamline access to capital globally, being able to make it easy to build in a country and sell in different countries uh, and facilitating interaction of people. Thank you very much for that, Chandni. Lots of interesting food for thought in this um, initial uh, phase of our panel today. Um, I'm also particularly interested. I think it's something that almost all the panel members have touched upon, but the sort of dual nature of um, uh, the challenges and opportunities that COVID throws up, challenges and opportunities. Um, and while on the one hand, it makes it harder for cross-border uh, boundary entrepreneurship or cross-border 
anything because of the challenges of physical travel. On the other hand, it's also opening up opportunities by allowing more remote work and making people wake up to the fact that you can have these cross-border teams and though they can just stay where they are but still work together collaboratively. And I think we're finding it even on panels like this. It might not have been possible for uh, Oracis to like fly me in from Japan to uh, moderate this panel uh, if we were all meeting physically. Uh, but, you know, we have the opportunity, all of us to gather here without too much uh, uh, fuss because we're doing it um, over Zoom and these kinds of technology platforms. So indeed, it's a kind of um, uh, double-edged coin, double-sided coin. And it's very interesting how that's going to play out. Um, if I can just go back to uh, Mile first. Um, Mile, you had mentioned about how you're in your company, you had already, you were doing quite well because you'd already developed many of the technologies that were needed um, uh, in order to be able to work remotely and so on. So would you agree with the idea that what we are really seeing for post COVID is just an acceleration of trends that were already in the pipeline rather than a fundamental transformation in how we are working? Or do you think that there is something bigger that's uh, going to happen uh, uh, post pandemic? Um, from my own experience, I think um, there are both sides. Uh, for example, I try to make everything in my company approved online and we ride it for nearly more than two years and the online approval is not, uh, was not done everywhere in the whole group. But only one week before we started the social distancing, I called for everyone um, for a rehearsal and one week later, everything was there. So, I mean, if you ask who is the um, key driver for the digitalization uh, in the company, it's COVID, not myself. <laughs> it's a funny yeah. story but to say that even though we are well prepared, acceleration really depends on the mindset of people. And uh, I think even in Vietnam, the young uh, are very tech savvy. They are very frequent on social network, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on so many different uh, tools and apps. But they 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 are still hesitant to move on with some uh, application in, in a big scale in the business. So uh, I I think. Uh, there's some kind of uh, constraint in COVID, but suddenly uh, people learn that so many things can be done very easily online or on the cloud uh, that they, they couldn't believe uh, before, before COVID. And the behavior really helped leverage the application of technology into the social life of uh, home uh, applicants and and. and in the business arena. Um, I mean, mindset will really change and then people will move on with more um, digital uh, usage uh, anywhere, any corner of the life. Okay, thank you. Um, Santosh, very quickly, I realize we only have about 18, 17, 18 minutes left and we also have questions coming in from the audience. So if we can just keep uh, um, our responses sort of short and sharp. Um, but, you know, what something interesting that you brought up was about um, this perennial problem about having uh, governments on a sort of different timeline to the tech companies and the entrepreneurs that are actually trying to do things. Um, how do you do you see that COVID will actually help maybe to bring um, these two more in sync with each other, with people realizing um, uh, the importance of the digital transformation and sort of taking that on board? Or do you think that we're going to see a greater lag perhaps and that therefore becoming a big challenge uh, for um, startups and entrepreneurs that the governments are not keeping pace with their needs? No, um, I am a technology optimist. So I always think technology can solve uh, all Everything. the problems. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I mean, some of my thoughts could also seem radical, but I, I actually foresee government and governance as two different things. And at some point uh, in future, we will see governance with least involvement from government. And I think uh, that is a future I would like to live in, uh, where 
people can govern themselves and still be able to be part of a society where we can respect each other's values, uh, make the trade happen between each other, share value system. Um, yeah, so I believe uh, that's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to solve. And I'm optimistic that um, it will happen sooner than later. Would anyone else like to jump in on this, uh, looking at sort of policy and governments and uh, how, how um, they see them reacting to the needs of uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship? See, uh, if, you, if you really look at it, it's, it's not a choice, it's a compulsion. Mm. I totally agree with Santosh. Government tomorrow, by force of reality, has to move away from their old brick and mortar bureaucratic model. You will have to get changed yourself to a more digital model, more governance oriented model. And I, I do share the optimism of Santosh that this is going to come sooner than later. So since we have you, Shoma, may perhaps we could get a little bit more into um, your point earlier about Southeast Asia and or not just Southeast Asia, East Asia and Southeast Asia and um, and India. Um, what do you think are the big challenges over there? Something just as simple as language continues to be a huge barrier. I mean, I'm based in Japan and we've seen Japanese companies being notorious uh, in terms of being able to open up and globalize. And, you know, it often just comes down to linguistic and uh, linguistic problems and communication problems. So something as simple as that is not even being solved by all the technology that we have out there. So uh, uh, what do you think are the big, big barriers and how do you think we can overcome these cultural yeah. linguistic barriers? Uh, language is the biggest biggest barrier but at the yeah. same time it's also true uh, over the last 200 years of British colonial influence in the global globe there has been a lot of shift towards English and English is more or less accepted so we, we need to utilize that situation we can't have a one May I have a quick intervention, Shomo, at this point? You know, the number of Japanese companies that I have met who think that everybody has to learn Japanese and that they are trying to recruit in India and their method is to go to Indian universities and offer Japanese language courses so that people will sign up, learn Japanese and then go to Japan to work. You know, but they cannot think of just working in English. <laughs> so it's like, uh, that's like a bridge too far. They'd rather like invest in education and try to find people that they will teach teach Japanese too for four years before they actually start working rather than, you know, just switch to English. So well, I, 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 wish them, I wish them all the best. <laughs> yes. They are not going to succeed because the world is different. Everybody in the government must be, we probably would like to do that, but trade and relationship will come into a different format altogether. So what yeah. happens, very frankly, there are political problems in our part of the world. They are our uh, there are relationship problems within the countries. But yeah. if you can take an initiative of creating a proper platform, a digital platform where we share everything what's happening here in the business area, the products, services, our needs. You know, you know, you have an Alibaba who's selling Chinese goods globally, but mm -hmm. we don't have a platform where we are in a position to share our uh, business and our uh, you know, wishes for our part of the world. And the moment you start doing this kind of a change, and this is an opportunity with um, uh, one, the global re relationship, some part of the world are becoming now, they, they are becoming in looking than out looking. And that is a time where small businesses and entrepreneurs probably through a collaborative effort, utilizing digital platform and pushing all their products and services over there and finding partners and relationships can really make a differentiating change in the world. Right. Thank you for that. You know, we have a couple of questions from the audience and only 10 minutes left in the panel. So I think we'll go to some of these and perhaps Bernard, if you could take one of them. Uh, we have a question, which is how can cross boundary entrepreneurship nurtured with travel restrictions and the social stigma associated with travel and impending danger due to COVID-19? I think the question is, how do you see that playing out and affecting entrepreneurship? Well, as long as we can't travel, we have to meet like we meet now. And uh, this system of digital meeting is okay, but I can tell you there are much, much better systems available already. And I'm sure these will be much more common. 
There are systems where you stand in a room and there's a big screen, a full wall screen, and you have the feeling the person who is in the next continent stands next to you. So we we'll have systems like that. And therefore, I think that can be overcome. But I'm pretty sure, and I can see it now already, flying is restarting. Um, and we will not fly as we did. I mean, I was on a plane every week. This will be the past. But when you meet an entrepreneur, when you want to do business with them, you in initially anyway start getting comfortable via digital, whatever. Then you meet. Maybe you meet a few times and then you don't meet every day. And from that angle, I think even with the current or with the flight that will come up, I'm absolutely positive that uh, it will come back. And then maybe you meet once a year or twice a year and that is possible. So from that angle, I'm not so pessimistic on that front. Bernard, a quick follow up to this. How much do you think that the digital platforms and the wonderful better ones than the ones we are using right now that you are talking about really replicate um, um, the, the sort of in-person experience? And do you think that they can make up for what is lost? Um, what is, you know, the, the, that physical presence actually really doesn't matter that much. You had talked a little bit about this um, in your earlier comment about education and, and the friendships, uh, but surely friendships and rapport can also develop digitally like we are establishing a rapport right now aren't we uh, that is true um, I don't think it's replaceable hmm. but I think it can change substantially and frankly when we look at pre-corona um, hmm. of course we were meeting certain people on a regular basis but we were doing business with a lot of people we never met personally or we met perhaps once or twice and then the thing was established or we meet indirect. Maybe they meet someone whom we know very well, a confident, and he builds that indirect confidence. So probably these systems will come up. And I mean, when you go back in history, before we were flying, we were still doing business with the world. Absolutely. And they're very often, we didn't meet for years, you know. That's right. Um, Chandani, could you take the next question that we have from the audience, which is about work? It says, what about work from home and alternative work options for blue collar workers? So technology and digitally curated firms are doing quite well. Um, but there's a whole other uh, host of uh, jobs and people who uh, get, you know, very uh, negatively impacted. I, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, I don't have much experience with the blue collar sector at all because yeah. we and they are right in saying that we're fortunate in being in a sector where we can work from home. We can try the bulk of our work is over laptops and you can just meet people on a meetings. Uh, yeah, all I can all I can say is uh from, well, Do you maybe part, see that there, there, there are ways to use this technology in other kinds of companies that have not traditionally been very digitally oriented, but perhaps to uh, for them to start adapting now? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That uh, even if you look at the uh, if you look at what is called the gig economy and this the sort of uh, industries which are uh, which were not as digitally even if they, when they could have taken up digital means of getting work, of uh, sourcing work, of producing work, of reviewing work, hadn't sort of, uh, hadn't transformed to it. But, in, you know, that thing of saying sometimes nothing happens for years and then progress happens in two weeks is pretty much mm -hmm. what happened. Uh, with the, the kind of clients we work with, those people didn't really need to go to office, but they just had this thing of people have to come into work and they have to, you have to be sitting on your desk and be doing your work. Uh, and in a situation where people couldn't come to office that forced them and I'm primarily talking about investment managers and hedge fund managers that we work with they forced them to set up these systems at their home and work so uh there have been yes I'm still it, it, it's still in a fortunate area where people can still do their work from home uh it did force uh, a take up of technology and of digital means of communicating digital means of uh reviewing work digital means of uh participating uh in teams digital means of sort of which somebody else has actually just asked a question of increasing collaboration with people that you were otherwise used to being in the office with you. And if that has happened there, I'm sure there are gaps even in the blue collar space, which could be filled by just having a digital transformation. There's something that 
hasn't been considered so far but has sort of become the need of the hour now yes please uh, shoma yeah uh, you know this is a very critical point which is yeah, raised in this absolutely i work with manufacturing industries and manufacturing industries are having whole lot of problems hmm. because you know they got they they are not culturally they are not tuned to uh, maintaining the safe distance and working in that fashion however covid is making that significant change by induction of new technologies we are putting up new technology where each person can be identified whether he is within 6 feet of another person within the uh, within the uh, manufacturing plant and you accordingly will get an exception report to take on with that guy and once you start doing it there are a whole lot of time we are by habit we are close by we don't need to be so we need to really re rehash our way of things and technology is going to be of a tremendous use to do that you know in my company earlier we are an old old era people who used to believe that people must store meet your people meet your guys hand hold them we even the last three Shake months hands, look them in the eye to look them in the eye we have completely changed over we have now started our own attendance and uh, work related mobile app whereby each individual you don't know, the mobile app does everything and the, you get a report of who is going where why not and there is a zoom and we are using zoom in a big big way yeah and that's really even on the operating people the supervision is becoming very easily automated so i think things are changing but at the same time i must say this i seem to be the most optimist i don't see this going to continue for very long we are going to accept covid as a part of our system in another 6 to 9 months time and you know we will live with it people will again start traveling and reaching to travel i am meeting to go go to my customers in other places and we will do it sooner than later things will become yes this one year of covid will remain with us for i'll have to stop you there because we have sure. such little time left no but all very interesting points and of course it remains to be seen how different the new normal is from the old normal i mean some people are envisaging a completely different world it's quite possible that things actually go back to a lot of what we were used to far quicker than we expect bernard i saw you are uh, raising your finger a quick uh, 30 seconds uh, intervention please Yes I just wanted to add that with industry 4.0 we were already starting this way of combination of manufacturing and IT and this will just go on it will be catapultized uh, and I can tell you the digital dividend that we will be able to harvest harvest in not too far away time will be substantial and on top of it we will hopefully have an environmental Uh, dividend and we can see it already now suddenly in delhi and bombay we can all the pollution there. yeah and just half a year ago we were saying we will die all from the air so that's another nice dividend so i think we should be positive it'll work but as shomo said you know the moment they lift the restrictions the air can be as fetid as uh, before we let's hope we learn some lessons and at least the positives of um uh, what we have seen from covid continue um one very we can take one last quick question let's look at um what technology stacks can help decrease gaps and increase collaboration in a cross border perspective who would like to answer this yes please go ahead santosh blockchain um because <laughs> how did i have a feeling you were going to say that yeah so because trust is something which is uh, inherently important especially in times like this and we need to create trustless systems um a stack like blockchain can help us rethink almost every industry the fact that a startup based out of india has less chances of raising capital than a startup based in silicon valley just says that we have a broken system the fact that somebody who is uh, working in a different part of the world gets paid less than somebody working in a different part of the world also says we have a broken system mm. and blockchain has the ability to fix these things and um, help us rethink and yeah go decentralization chandni very quickly did you want to add anything i saw you raising your finger earlier yeah sorry i just just because you were asking about because we sort of made this transition to being completely digital completely remote i think platform by these just being able to have a, a video conferencing platform being able to have a platform where a, a platform like slack where you're talking to people pretty much in real time like you were in the office with them and being able to have a platform 
uh, like a G Suite or something, which is an online collaboration tool. So all of your documents are on the, in the digital space. They're basically primarily all digital. Uh, and the last thing I want to add, the benefits of being this today, I can sell to clients in the US, in the UK, in Singapore. It doesn't matter where they are, just because everybody is now expected to hold meetings online. Right. And that is, I think, the real potential of COVID. It's forced us to think about having these interactions digitally and things that wouldn't be allowed are allowed now. That's fantastic. I'm afraid we're all out of time. You know, I had this clock going off for the last five minutes. So I've been feeling quite nervous. I thought they pulled the plug and we suddenly have a blank screen. So I'm glad we're all still here. But uh, thank you so much for joining uh, what was a really fascinating discussion. And I just wish we had a little bit more time um, to, to go a little bit deeper. But maybe there'll be other opportunities uh, and maybe see you all on Zoom uh, sooner <laughs> rather than later. Thank you very yeah. much uh, for joining and thank you also to our audience for listening in and their, their great questions. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.